My last duty today, my last job, is one that gives me great joy. I get to introduce a friend, and a friend of long standing. And everybody knows Rick, right? Everybody knows Rick Warren. Rick Warren prays before presidents take the oath of office. Rick Warren transforms Africa. Rick Warren has the Daniel Project. Rick Warren has sold 50 million, 60 million copies of The Purpose Driven Life. And he and Kay give away 90% of everything that they get. And they know that he's led in the last year uh, a, a path for and many people in this country through a time of great sorrow. And they know that, well, they know everything about Rick. But here's something they don't know about Rick that only I know about Rick. Because 25 years ago, in my day job, I'm a lawyer, and my phone rings, and it's a woman named Lisa Hughes that many of you will know, and she said, will you come see my pastor, Rick Warren? He bought a piece of land for a church, and it's covered with gnat catchers. I'm a land use lawyer. It's absolutely covered with gnat catchers. So I drive down to a little tiny shopping center in El Toro, and I walk in, and I sit down with a guy named Rick Warren, who's 35 years ago, had hair like mine was not white then either. And he proceeds to tell me why he needs 40 or 50 acres, because he's got a plan. It's actually not his plan, it's God's plan. He tells me he received a call to come to Orange County, and he and Kay had gone door to door and knocked on doors and set up chairs. And I'm listening to this young man with no land and a lot of birds that you can't move. Uh, Tell me how he plans to change Orange County, not just Orange County, but California and the world. And of course, because I'm a very practical person, I'm thinking, this guy is nuts. <laughs> he wasn't nuts. He was God's man. And uh, everything you've heard about since then, he has not changed. And so it's with incredible, incredible gratitude for his presence here in our county that I introduce our second keynote today, America's pastor, Rick Warren. Rick? Well, it's good to see so many friends. I came here today, first of all, to say thank you. I want to say thank you to my dear friend and prayer partner, Bishop Kevin Van, who, since he's come here, has become a very, very dear friend of mine. And uh, as you know, we, we're doing a lot of things together. Also, I came to say thank you to Bishop Todd Brown, who has been a friend for many, many years before that. Actually, Norm McFarlane before Bishop McFarlane before him. When, when uh, I was young, when Hugh was telling those stories, when I was in my 20s, Bishop McFarlane and I used to travel around together to high schools, public high schools, and try to convince kids not to drink on prom night. And we, we had this little shtick, this little uh, program that we did together. And so I, I've known three of the four bishops of of this diocese, one of the great dioceses and one of the most significant dioceses in all of, all of America. But I wanted to come to thank you for your prayers. You know this was the most difficult year of my life. This last year when my youngest son, who had struggled with mental illness for 27 years, took his life five days after Easter. It was the worst day of my life, and I'm still not out of that grief. I have wept every day since my son died. Many of you sent me prayer cards from your parishes. Many of you had uh, mass intentions for our family and for Matthew. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, uh, dear, dear friends. 27 years ago, I'm not going to spend time on this, but uh, when Kay was pregnant with our last child, I won't go into the details, but she had a very difficult pregnancy, and I thought she was going to die. Uh, we had been on some mission trips, and I think she picked up something really strange. But going through my mind was, is my wife going to live? And the second question, is my son going to live? And then, or the baby? And number three, is the baby going to be healthy? Kay lived. Matthew lived, but he was not healthy. And he struggled with mental illness his entire life. He had a very tender heart and a very tortured mind. He was a brilliant, brilliant kid and had an ability to walk into a room like this and his antenna were up and he would instantly know who was in the most pain. And he would make a beeline for that person and spend the rest of the evening encouraging that person. Uh, my older son and I would go meet everybody in the room while Matthew would focus on the person in the most pain. 
I probably received 30, 35,000 letters of condolences, prayer cards, and different notifications. And the ones that meant the most to me were not from the VIPs, the prime ministers, and the rock stars, and the presidents, but really the ones that meant the most to me were cards from people that Matthew had led to faith in Christ during his life. And I remember writing in my journal that day, in God's garden of grace, even broken trees bear fruit. And the fact is, folks, we're all broken. Everything on this planet is broken because of sin. And uh, we have broken relationships, broken marriage, broken economy, broken weather, broken... Everything is broken. That's why we pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Because in heaven, God's will is done perfectly, instantly, and continuously. And on earth, God's will is often done seldom and incontinuously and often with a lot of reluctance. So thank you. Thank you for your, your prayers. Right? Uh, a couple months ago, we had visiting uh, a, the Pontifical Academy of Life from the Vatican sent about, I don't know, 30 or so uh, people to come to Saddleback, and we were talking. We've been trying to help parishes around the world in the new evangelization. And they asked me one of the questions, and I thought I'd tell you my answer since we we're talking about a conference on business and ethics. And uh, one of the bishops from France asked me, said, um, so what makes a Christian business? What makes a business that God can bless? And I used a little acrostic that I've used all around the world. I spent most of the last 10 years in little villages in poor countries around the world that you've never heard of. And I often teach uh, businessmen in Africa and Asia and Latin America that a, a business that God blesses has cows, C-O-W-S. You might remember this little acrostic. C, uh, first, the customer benefits. If you don't have a customer, you don't have a business. O, the owner's benefit. If you don't have a profit, you don't have a business. Even nonprofits have to make a profit. It's just they don't accrue to, to, uh, to the directors. There's, that's not a bad word. In fact, the right to profit pri private property is actually in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. So the, the customer benefits, the owner benefits. Third, in a lot of Businesses overseas don't get this, and that's that the workers benefit, that we share the benefits of our profits. But then the S, and this really is what makes a business Christian, is society benefits. And we begin to give back, and we begin to help. Things like what you just heard a sister talk about, Catholic education. By the way, I'm a Protestant or an evangelical pastor. Both of my oldest kids went to Catholic schools. So... Uh, Sister, I'll put in $5,000 on that one, okay? So you now got, you now got 40. All right, I'll, I'll, fund, I'll, fund, I'll fund a person, and uh, come on. If an evangelical can fund 5,000, everybody in this room can too. So pick that card back up, all right? All right, you're a Catholic. Good night, man. You can could, you could do 5,000, five grand, really. Was that good enough, Bishop? Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> I want to say one other thing before I start, and I'm going to ask your prayers for me because I'm not nervous in speaking. I've done speaking in front of crowds of a million and even two million people around the world. But in November, I'm a little nervous because I, I received a call from the Vatican, and I've been asked to be one of the two American speakers at a conference on marriage and family at the Vatican in November. And so... I pray that I will represent Orange County well. So, in, in thanks to you for your prayers, uh, I, Kay and I decided I, I wanted to bring a copy of Purpose Driven Life, and after this is over, anybody, if you'd like one for free, I'd be happy to give you one, just as my gift to say thank you for you for this prayers in the most difficult year. Now, this is a theme on business and ethics. And I want to talk to you, uh, just in the closing moments, just very briefly, about what I think is the most important question of ethics you can ask as a business leader or just as a man or woman of God. The most important ethical question you can ask is what I call the second most important question of life. 
There are two great themes throughout Scripture, from Genesis to Revelation. One is the theme of salvation, and the other is the theme of stewardship. What are we doing with what we've been given? The most important question, of course, is the question, what have you done with my son, Jesus Christ? And, of course, you know the answer to that one, and that you've put your trust in him and your faith in him, and you love him with all your heart, and you serve him as we do as Christians who believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But the second most important question is a question that God asks Moses in Exodus chapter 4. Now, Moses' life can be summarized in three phases. The first 40 years of Moses' life, he was learning to be a somebody in Pharaoh's court. The second 40 years of Moses' life, he, learned, he spent on the backside of a desert learning to be a nobody. And the third 40 years, he spent leading the children of Israel across the wilderness, learning to be God's somebody. This event happens at the second end of the second phase. So Moses is 80 years old when this is happening. He's been out tending sheep for 40 years. He thinks everybody's forgotten him. He's on the backside of a desert. And one day as he's tending his sheep, he sees a burning bush, as you know the story, and God speaks out of that burning bush. And God says, Moses, take off your shoes. This is holy ground. And so Moses takes off his shoes. And then God asks Moses a question, and this is the most ethical question I think you can ask about your life or your business. And God asked Moses this question. Moses, what is in your hand? What is in your hand? Moses says, it's a staff, it's a shepherd's staff. God says, throw it down. And so Moses throws it down, and it becomes a what? Yeah, snake. I mean, something that is dead, it's just a bed, dead piece of wood, comes alive. He throws it down, and it comes alive. And then God says, Moses, pick it up. So Charlton Heston leans over. <laughs> oh, you saw that one. Okay, yeah. and, and he picks it up, and when he picks up that servant, what happens to it? It, it becomes a stick again. Okay, now... What is that story all about? Isn't that a strange story? Doesn't that seem like one of the weirdest stories you've ever heard? God says, Moses, what's in your hand? A staff. Throw it down, it becomes a snake. Pick it up, it becomes a, 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 a staff again. What is that all about? Why is that story even in the Bible? Well, let me suggest a couple things. First, number one, God never does a miracle to show off. Okay, there's always a reason. Every miracle is a parable, and every parable is a miracle of divine truth. And so God is trying to teach Moses something. God isn't saying, hey, Moses, look at this new trick. I learned it over at the Magic, Magic Castle. You'll love it. You can wow people at cocktail parties. It'll really be great. Throw it down, it becomes a snake. Pick it up, it becomes a stick. People will love this, Moses. No, God never does a miracle to show off. Second thing... When God asks you a question, it's never for his benefit. In other words, he already knows the answer. God knew what was in Moses' hand a thousand years before Moses was born. He's God. So whenever God asks you a question, it's never for his benefit. He wanted Moses to know what was in his hand. Now, I want to submit to you that this simple little story, throw it down, it becomes a serpent, it comes alive, pick it up, it dies again, is one of the most significant stories in the entire Bible. Because if this hasn't happened, then there is no Exodus. There is no Ten Commandments. There is no nation of Israel, so there is no Messiah, so there is no crucifixion and resurrection, so there is no church, and we're not here today if this hadn't happened. I want to submit to you that it is one of the single most important stories in the entire Bible. But you've got to understand the symbolism of the staff. In every profession, there is some symbol that represents that calling, that vocation, that staff. For instance, if I'm wearing a... Um, uh, you know, uh, a, a stethoscope around my neck, then you're going to figure out I'm probably a doctor. 
If I'm wearing a, uh, a, a flight attendant, a captain's hat, uh, and, and uh, a flight jacket, you probably figure out I'm a pilot. If I'm wearing the symbol of a, uh, a utility belt, and I've got hammers and screwdrivers and, and things like that hanging off that belt, you probably figure I'm in construction. I may be a carpenter. If I'm wearing a, a lab coat, uh, a white lab coat, then you figure I'm, I'm either a scientist or a technician or some medical assistant of some kind. Every profession has some kind of symbol. And the, the symbol of the staff, in Moses' case, represents three things. First, the symbol represents Moses' identity. It represents who he was because he was a shepherd. He was a shepherd. Moses had been a shepherd for 40 years. It was his business. It was his vocation. It was his calling. It, it represented his identity. The shepherd's staff is the symbol of being a shepherd. But more than that, it represented not only his identity, it represented his income. Because in those days, all your income was determined by how many livestock you had. They didn't have banks in those days. They didn't have stock markets or certificates or bonds or any of these kind of things. And so it was very easy to tell who was wealthy in Moses' day. If you had a lot of sheep, cattle, and goats, you were very wealthy. If you had a few sheep, cattle, or goats, uh, you were middle class. If you had no sheep, cattle, or goats, you were poor. And so the shepherd's staff represents his flocks, which represents all of Moses' assets are tied up in his flock. It's his business. It's not just his identity. It's his income. All his income comes from raising those sheep. That's why in the book of Proverbs, there's a verse that says, know well the condition of your flocks. And a lot of modern translations translate that verse, keep a close watch on your business interests. Because that's what it means. Know well the condition of your flocks. Are they healthy? Are you making a profit or are you, are you lost? Are you, is the graph going up or down? Know well the condition of your flocks. Today, God would say, know well the condition of your stocks. But in those days, it all had to be tied up in, in, uh, in animals. So it represents not only who he is, his identity, the shepherd's staff represents what he owns. It represents his wealth. It represents his income. And now, not only that, the shepherd's staff represents Moses' identity and his income. It also, number three, represents his influence. Why? Because a shepherd's staff is a tool of influence. It's the thing you use to move sheep from point A to point B. You use a shepherd's staff to move sheep along from where they are to where you want them to be. You either pull them or you poke them. It's by hook or by crook. And you move them along. And so the shepherd's staff represents who he is, his identity, what he owns, his income, and what he does and what influence he has with his life as he moves sheep. When God says, Moses, I want you to throw down your staff, he is symbolically saying to him, Moses, I want you to give me everything in your life and all it represents. I want you to surrender to me your identity, your influence, and your income. And Moses, if you will surrender your identity and your influence and your income to me, and you will lay it down, and you will give it to me, and you'll let me use it the way I want to use it as Almighty God, I will make it come alive. And you will do miracles, and you'll see miracles that will blow your mind, that will knock your socks off, that you will not believe happened if you'll just lay it down and surrender those things to me. But, Moses, every time you pick it up and you take it back, it's going to die. It's just an old stick. In my hands, I can make it living. I can make it miraculous. I can do all kinds of things with your identity, influence, and income. But, Moses, every time you take it back and you say, it's mine, it's my money, 
It's my identity. It's my influence. It's who I am. It's my family. It's just going to turn into an old stick again. This is one of the most significant lessons you have to learn about ethics in the Bible. What is in your hand? Now, I want to say that after this incident happens in the Bible, from this point on, it is never again in the Bible referred to as Moses' staff. Never once. From this point on in the Bible, it is always referred to as the rod of God. And it is the rod of God that Moses dips into the Nile River and it turns red like blood. And it is the rod of God that Moses holds up over the Red Sea and it splits the Red Sea. And it is the rod of God that Moses strikes the rock at Mara and water comes out to, feed, uh, to give thirst quenching to a million Jews crossing across the desert. Every miracle that God did in his people, he did through the rod of God at that moment because Moses was willing to lay it down. The question I have for you this morning at the Irvine Marriott is this. What is in your hand? What is your identity? What is your influence? What is your source of income? What is it that represents who you are and what you own and who you influence? God is saying to you, this is an ethical decision. Because if you do it all for yourself, it just becomes a stick. But if you lay it down and you surrender it to God and you say, God, this is yours to use as you see fit, God says, I will do amazing miracles in your life. You know, it's an interesting thing that of the 10 plagues that Moses did, God actually did them, but he used Moses to do those plagues uh, in Egypt. Every one of those plagues made fun of a false god, an idolatrous god. You see, the Egyptians worshipped frogs. So God said, you like frogs? I'll give you a lot of frogs. <laughs> and there were frogs everywhere. Uh, the Egyptian worshipped cattle. He said, you like cattle? We'll give you boils on your cattle. The Egyptians worshipped the sun. He said, you like sun? We'll just make it dark for a week. Every one of the ten plagues, God is saying, they are not God. Possessions aren't God, passions aren't God, pleasures aren't God, prosperity isn't God, prestige isn't God, sex, salary, status, and everything else. None of those things are God's. There's nothing wrong with them, but they're not God. And they don't belong at the center of your life. How do you know when something other than God is at the center of your life? Well, it's real simple. There's one word for it. It's called worry. Are any of you vaguely familiar with this term? Worry is the evidence that something has replaced God at the center of your life. You see, if you want true security in your life, then you must build it on something that can never be taken from you. You can lose your wealth. There's a lot of ways to lose it. You can lose your family. There's a lot of ways to lose your family. You can lose your health, you can lose your reputation, you can lose your good looks. Some of you have already lost them. <laughs> you, can, you can lose your mind. So never put your security in something that can be taken from you. You must put your security in something that can never be taken from you, and that is your relationship to God through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That can never be taken from you. The Bible says, neither life nor death, nor heights nor depths, nor angels, nor demons, nor anything else shall be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is the fundamental ethical question you have to ask in business. And first question is, whose business is it? If it's my business, it's just a stick. If I've laid it down and said, God, it's your family, it's your business, and God, even my life is your life. I would have nothing without you. 
This is the principle of stewardship, that we're simply managers of what God has given us. We own nothing. We own nothing. Everything we have is because of God's great love for us. Now, the Bible says that God is love. It doesn't say he has love. It says God is love. It is the nature of God. It is his character. It is essence. God doesn't have love. He is love. There would be no love in the universe if God wasn't a God of love. The only reason you're able to love your husband or your wife or your kids or your parents or your friends or your boyfriend or girlfriend, the only reason we have any love is because God, the creator, is love. God loves you on your good days and he loves you on your bad days. He loves you when you feel it. He loves you when you don't feel it. He loves you when you think you deserve it. He loves you when you don't think you deserve it. You can't make God stop loving you. You could try, but you will fail. Why? Because God's love isn't based on who you are, but who he is. It's not based on what you do. It's based on what Jesus did for you on the cross 2,000 years ago. It is grace. And when I walk in that grace, in that unconditional love, then I can open my grip and I can let it go. You know, the first four words of Purpose Driven Life have become pretty famous now. It's, it's not about you. And when I was writing that book, I tried to think of the most counterculture statement I could possibly make on the first line. <laughs> because everything in our society says it's all about you. Every commercial is designed to appeal to your narcissism. Have it your way. We do it all for you. You deserve the best today. Look out for number one. It's you, 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 you. It's all about me. And yet the Bible says, no, it's not all about you. It's all about God. In fact, Jesus said it is only in giving our lives away that we ever understand what it means to truly live. You lose your life to find it, Jesus said. Now, in your business, you have to first settle the ethical question. And that is, what is in your hand? Then you have to settle the three ethical temptations. And those three temptations have been the same from the beginning of time. You know, in John 3.16, the most famous verse in the Bible, it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You know the rest of that verse. What a lot of people don't know is in 1 John chapter 3, the same guy wrote that, Apostle John, and he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world, for the love of the, everything that is in the world is the opposite of the love of the Father. So which one is it? In John 3, we're told, God so loved the world. And in 1 John, we're told, don't love the world. So which one is it? In John chapter 3, it's talking about the people of the world. And in 1 John, it's talking about the value system of the world. We are to love all people in the world. I am commanded to love everybody. I am not allowed to hate anyone as a Christian. I am not allowed to hate anyone. I am to love. My Savior demands that I love everybody. The Bible says I even have to love my enemies. So I am to love everybody, but I am to hate the world's value system. And then the next verse in 1 John tells us what that value system is. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father, but are of this world. The lust of the flesh has to do with passions. The lust of the eyes has to do with possessions. I see it and want it. And the lust and the pride of life has to do with position, has to do with pride and position. In other words, it is, as I said earlier, it's sex and it's salary and it's status. The only thing you could say good about Satan is that he has not had any new temptations in thousands of years. <laughs> He's highly predictable. And the same three temptations he used on Adam and Eve, he used on Moses, he used on Abraham, he used on Jesus, and he uses them on you. He doesn't have any new temptations. And every temptation comes under one of these three. Aquinas was brilliant on these three temptations. If you go back and read what Aquinas said on this, and by the way, it was Pope Leo the Great who said, there is no virtue without temptation. In other words, I can't say I'm good unless I've been tempted to be bad. I can't say I'm faithful unless I've been tempted to be unfaithful. 
can't say I'm humble unless I'm tempted to be prideful. So uh, Pope Leo the Great said, there is no virtue without temptation. So God tells us what the temptations are. The lust of the flesh is the temptation to feel. I want to feel good. People think that's sex. Yes, it's sex, but it can also be food, television, drugs, or anything that gives you pleasure. Now, pleasure isn't wrong, but anything out of control becomes a sin. Lust of the flesh is the temptation to feel. I want to feel good. And sometimes when you've been working really hard at work and you've had a long day and you come home and, and Satan will whisper in your ear and he'll say, the temptation, you deserve this. You're doing so many good things. You deserve, this is an ethical question. The lust of the eyes is a temptation to have. I see it and I want it. It's greed, it's materialism. I see it and I want it. And the pride of life is the temptation to be. The temptation, all ethical decisions come down to one of these three temptations. I want to be, I don't just want to be liked, I want to be loved. No more than that, I want to be envied. In fact, what we really want is we want to be worshipped. And Jesus said, thou shalt have no other gods before me, in the, great, in the Ten Commandments, the Bible says, and Jesus said, worship the Lord your God only, and him only shalt thou serve. So the temptation to have and to feel and to be all come from the lust of flesh, lust of eyes, pride of life. Now we see this, for instance, in, in Adam. Adam had an ethical decision to make. And Eve, uh, there too. And it says, first it says, the fruit was pleasing to the eye. I see it and I don't want it. That's lust of the eyes. It looked good. And then it says, it was pleasing to the taste. That's lust of the flesh. Flesh. It tasted good. And then Satan says, and when you eat that fruit, you'll be a god. You'll be God. You see, the temptation is never a temptation to do evil. Satan never says, do this and you'll be like me. Because <laughs> nobody wants to be like him. Satan says, no, no, eat this and you'll be a god. That's the pride of life. It's the same three temptations. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. As I said, Aquinas goes into this in quite in detail. And, 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 and so Eve took it, and then she gives it to her husband, and then God comes and asks a question. Remember, God never asks a question for his benefit. He knew, he says, Adam, where are you, and what have you done? He just wants Adam to own up. Of course, Adam took it like a man and blamed his wife. <laughs> and we've been doing that ever since. I call it hiding and hurling. We hide and we hurl at others. But they did it. In fact, Adam says, Lord, the woman you gave me, <laughs> he's actually blaming God. Can you imagine this? He's blaming God. The woman, this is not an ethical decision, friends. And then we come to Jesus and the three temptations that he went through are the exact three same as Adam, this is the ethical dilemma every businessman and every person has to face over and over again in life. Satan comes to Jesus one day and says, um, Jesus had been fasting for 40 days, turn these stones to bread. Now, question, Jesus is hungry. He's just fasted 40 days. What's wrong with Jesus eating? Nothing. What's wrong uh, then with him turning stones to bread? Because God had given Jesus the ability to do miracles, not for his own benefit. Now here's the first temptation. You will be tempted to use the gifts that God has used in you, given you, for your benefit instead of the benefit of others. And that's a great temptation in business. That's an ethical temptation. Use the talents and abilities that God has given you to bless the world and help other people. Use them for your own benefit. You know, I have never been tempted by Satan to turn stone to bread. Why? God never gave me that talent. So I've never been talented. You, you see, we think that God wants to tempt us in our weakness. I mean, Satan wants to tempt us in our weakness. He does. But actually, he even tempts you more in your strengths. Satan doesn't mind you using your strengths as long as you use them for ego, for self, and not for God's glory and for his kingdom. And, and, and so he, he tells Jesus, turn these stones to bread. Jesus answers with a scripture, man shall not live by bread alone, 
But what is it? That's fulfill the lust of the flesh. Use your own pa- your prestige, your own power, your own profits just for yourself. Wrong, wrong answer. Then Satan takes Jesus in the second ethical dilemma. And he says, um, hey, Jesus, I got this great idea. Let's put you up here on top of the pinnacle of the temple and you jump off. And the angels will catch you on the way coming down and everybody will see it and it'll be really cool and everybody go, yay, God. And they'll all praise you. And it'll be a miraculous, great miracle. This will be fantastic. This will be on the nightly news. Now, what's wrong with Jesus being praised by people? Nothing. But God's method of praise is that we go through the cross, not by showing off. And the second ethical temptation of your life is to use the talents that God has given you to show off. You, God says, I've given you this for the good of others, not to show off. And the temptation to do the spectacular is a great temptation, either in business or ministry or even with our families. And then there's the final third ethical question that we have to deal with in business and home, and that is Satan takes Jesus and he says, um, he takes him up on a hill and he says, see all these riches of the world? All these things, this is material, all these things will I give you if you just fall down and worship me one time. This is the lust of the eyes. I see it and I want it. It is greed. It is greed. And you will be tempted to sell out God's purpose for your life in order to make more money. Wrong idea. So I conclude with this. If you want God's blessing on your business... If you want God's pleasure on your family, if you want God's anointing on your life, and you want to live an ethical life that God can bless, you must build your life on integrity, humility, and generosity. Integrity, humility, and generosity. Why? Because these are the antidotes to the three great temptations of life, and these are the values on which you build what is in your hand. First, you build it on integrity. When you build a business on integrity, it gets better and better every year. When you don't build it on integrity, it gets worse every year. Now, what is integrity? People think it means honesty. It does mean honesty, but it means far more than that. Integrity actually comes from the word integer or integer. It means a unit of one. It actually means wholeness. Integrity means it's the filling in the pie. It's not a piece of the pie. If you segment your life, you lack integrity. And we have a tendency to do this. We say, well, see this area over here? This is my business life. And this over here, this is my family life. And over here, this is my church life. And over here, this is my social life. And then over here is my golf life, my sports life. And then over here, this is my secret life. Okay. And over here, this is my sinful life that I, I don't want anybody to know about that. But we segment thinking that as long as I keep it segmented, it's okay. It's what I call the Titanic myth. You know, the Titanic myth was supposed to be the first unsinkable Boat. And the reason it's supposed to be the first unsinkable boat is the first boat to ever compartmentalize the hull. Prior to the Titanic, you had one hull, and if you hit, went up and you hit an uh, you know, uh, iceberg, then you knocked a hole in the boat, and the hull filled with water, and the boat sank. And so the Titanic said, here's what we'll do. We will compartmentalize. We will segmentize the hull. And that way, theoretically, you can hit a iceberg, take on water in a certain number of segments, kind of like in a submarine where you batten down the hatches in certain areas. You can take on water in certain areas, but it won't sink the whole boat. Now, theoretically, that's true. But it's also true that a hole in the boat is a hole in the boat is a hole in the boat. (laughs) And if you're sitting in a rowboat and I'm sitting the other end, I start drilling a hole in my end, and you say, Rick, what are you doing? You're taking us down. I say, it's my life. It's nobody else's business. 
Sin may be personal, but it is never private. People may not know about the sins in your life, but it definitely affects them whether they know about it or not. And we take people down with us all the time. Integrity means I don't segment my life. Integrity doesn't mean you're perfect. If it meant you're perfect, none of us would have integrity. Integrity just means I'm exactly what I appeared to be, whether I'm dealing with my grandkids playing Legos in my garage or when I'm on the stage last week at Royal Albert Hall and speaking at Parliament, that I'm exactly what I appear to be no matter where I am. That's integrity. So you build your life. Integrity is the antidote to the lust of the flesh because you don't segment your life. Say, that's a secret life over there, and that's okay. My pornography or whatever. Then the antidote to the lust of the eyes, materialism, is generosity. The only antidote to materialism is give. Materialism is get, 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 get. Get all you can, can all you get, sit on the can and spoil the rest. We buy things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't even like. (laughs) I want to tell you, quit trying to keep up with the Joneses. They just refinanced. (laughs) And they just went bankrupt too. But materialism, the antidote to materialism is give. Hugh mentioned that Kay and I are reverse tithers. Actually, we we started, when we were married 38 years ago, we began giving 10% of our income uh, back to the Lord. That's called tithing. And at the end of the first year, we raised it to 11%. At the end of our second year, we raised it to 12%. At the end of our third year of marriage, we actually raised it 3%. And you say, nobody told us to do this, and we actually didn't even tell anybody about it for over 30 years. But I just knew that every time I give, my heart grows giver, bigger. Every time I give, I become more generous. Every time I give, I become more like Jesus. Every time I give, it breaks the grip of materialism in my life. And on years that finances were tight, and the cupboard was bare, we still raised our giving just a quarter of a percent or whatever. And on years I got a raise or some windfall, we'd raise it three or four percent. Last year, we raised it a percent again from 90 to 91. I give away 91 percent and I live on nine. I haven't taken a salary. In fact, I serve my church for free now for 34 years. I take no outside speaking engagements, uh, uh, honorarium. And, uh, and I've played this game with God for 38 years where God says, Rick, let's play a little game. You give to me and I'll give to you and we'll see who wins. <laughs> I have lost that game for 38 years. Try it. you like it. The antidote to the lust of the flesh is integrity. The antidote to the ethical question of the lust of the eyes, materialism, is giving. And the more you give, the more generous you become, and the more happy you are. And then the antidote to the pride of life is humility. Humility is not denying your strengths. Humility is being honest about your weaknesses. You see, we're all a bundle of strengths and weaknesses. I have some great strengths. I have some enormous weaknesses. Just ask my staff, ask my family, ask my kids. If you ask me, I'll tell you. I'm, I'm more honest about them than anybody because I don't want you to think I don't recognize them. You have some great strengths. You also have some great weaknesses. And we're all a bundle of both. Humility is not saying, I'm no good, I'm nothing, I'm zero, I'm just junk. No, Jesus did not die for junk. You want to know how valuable you are? Look at the cross. With arms outstretched and nail-pierced hands, Jesus says, this is how much I love you. This is how much you matter to me. I love you so much, I'd rather die than live without you. That's how, that's how valuable you are, that Christ died for you. So you're not worthless. But humility is being honest about your weaknesses. That's why Paul could say, follow me as I follow Christ, and then at the same time say, but I'm the chief among sinners. These are the only three ethical questions you have to deal with. First, what is in your hand? And second, what are you doing with what you've been given? And third, how are you going to answer answer the three great temptations of life? I will close with this story. One of my great heroes was Archbishop Fulton Sheen. I think I've read everything he's ever written. One day, Fulton Sheen was uh, in a leprosy colony in, um, in Africa, and he walked over to speak to a man who was sitting on the ground in just a loincloth. 
and the man had nothing else on, and he, his body was covered with not just leprosy, but a lot of other skin diseases and sores because he had oozing, pussy sores all over his body. And as Fulton Sheen leaned over to bless the man, the crucifix that he was wearing on the chain, it, the chain somehow came unsnapped, and the cross fell into the open sore on the man's leg. Fulton Sheen said, when I first saw that, I was revolted by it. He said, I, you know, I just, I just the, the, the shock of seeing the cross fall into that, that pus was revolting to me. And then he said, suddenly I was filled with God's spirit. And I reached into the sore. And I took up the cross. I heard that story over 40 years ago, and I've never forgotten. It shook me to the core. Because when I heard that phrase, I reached into the sore and I took up the cross, I thought, that is the finest definition I've ever heard of a Christian and what it means to live a Christian life and be a follower of Jesus that I've ever heard. Because the whole business of following Jesus, is going out into the sores of life where people are hurting and bleeding and dying and poverty and injustice and prejudice against them and all kinds of bigotry and racism and all these hurting things in life and to reach into the sore and take up the cross. And if we're not doing that, I doubt our Christianity. Let's bow for prayer. Father, I want to thank you so much for these people who love you. They have faithfully served you over the years. Many of them have been great benefactors both to this diocese and to causes like Catholic education. And I pray that each of us would ask the question of ourselves that you ask of Moses, what is in our hands? We would look at our identity, our influence, our income. We would surrender it to you. We would lay it down. We would begin to live lives of purpose, lives fulfilling the purpose of God, just like David did in Acts 13, 36, where it says he served God's purpose in his generation. I pray that blessing on every person here. May we each serve God's purpose in our generation. May we do the timeless in a timely way. May we do that which never changes in a world that is constantly changing. And Lord, when the temptations that come in our businesses, in our families, and in our personal lives, to have, to feel, to be, and when Satan whispers in our ears, you deserve this, may we live with integrity and generosity and humility. I pray a prayer of blessing on every person today. Bless their families, bless their health, bless their finances, bless their minds with creative ideas, bless their businesses, not so they can be successful, but so that they can help build the kingdom of God. And I pray this blessing humbly in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Thank you.